I'm going to try and like position myself <laughs> where I can see the screen a little bit and also um, see you guys. So I'm sorry if I hide from some of y'all. I'll try to walk around a little bit. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me. I'm honored to be here, and I'm excited to see some kind of familiar faces. You guys are from Covenant, so hopefully this will be helpful to you all. Um, this project was part of a uh, Doctor of Nursing Practice capstone project, and it's also something that I work on um, quite a bit in consultation liaison services, and it's currently under review at Critical Care Nurse Journal. So fingers crossed there. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got started um, in delirium, and I like like um, you were telling everybody, I work in psychiatry and I do consultation liaison services. Which, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, it's um, it's treating substance use disorders, medical um, or I'm sorry, mental health and behavioral health disorders, while patients are in the general medical hospital. So we, we usually weigh in on ways to manage behavior or give some input on how to triage patients or where they may be best treated once they're medically stable. So we noticed um, quite a bit of delirium consults coming in over the last several years. And these uh, we, we kind of all have different approaches to how we handle this. So I wanted to make sure we were all on the same page and we were using the most evidence-based practice that we could. And, even though this is kind of a funny cartoon, I think it really captures the essence of patients in critical care sometimes. Um, they are really difficult to care for, especially when they're confused and um, disoriented. So this was my attempt to uh, kind of provide a, a protocol and a streamlined approach to these difficult patients. So I wanted to start by telling you about delirium. It is a really commonly confused uh, syndrome. It's not a disorder by itself and it's not um, a psychiatric condition necessarily. It's actually more of a compilation of symptoms that are more of an, I like to think of it as an alarm that something underlying is going on. Um, it occurs abruptly, and when I say abruptly, I mean more like hours to days, so pretty quickly. And you might even hear patients, family members say, something happened like overnight, my, my father, for example, doesn't act like this, he's confused, he's agitated, um, maybe more sedated looking. So it can be really scary for both the patients and the family members. Um, there are many contributing factors, so it can be really difficult to identify. And some of the contributing factors I'll go over in another slide. But just to get an idea, it can be age. Patients that are over 65 years of age are more likely to experience symptoms of delirium. And um, underlying medical conditions, so the more severe medical conditions, are going to predispose patients to these syndromes, um, medications, dehydration, lack of sleep, being in a new environment. So basically, I'm describing everybody in the ICU, right? Um, it's really common in the ICU. It's also difficult to identify because it fluctuates, and we call that in psychiatry waxing and waning, where the symptoms may um, present really strongly during one period of the day, but then the patient may look like themselves again at another part of the day. So it's really difficult to catch. Um, and the research is showing now that it's more of an acute brain failure uh, syndrome where it, can, it kind of follows the same lines as acute respiratory failure, acute uh, kidney failure, and it can be multi-organ system if we don't catch it and treat it quickly. So some of the medications that affect patients with uh, delirium or can, can worsen the symptoms of confusion are Benzodiazepines like Ativan, Xanax, Versed, um, things that we use commonly to help patients when they're anxious or agitated, and also pain medications like Oxycontin, Dilaudid, Morphine, um, and then Benadryl, which are anticholinergic classes of medication. So all three of those classes can be potentially dangerous, um, or some, some of them are possibilities to avoid. So when we look at potentially dangerous medications, we usually look towards guidelines such as the American Geriatric Society because they do a really nice job of putting out up-to-date um, reports on these medications and what's potentially dangerous and what may not be. So I think they recently updated their beers criteria um, here this year, I think just a few months ago. 
And one of the notable revisions or additions is uh, benzodiazepines like Ativan and um, opiates like morphine should not be used together, especially in patients that are over 65 years of age. And they can potentiate symptoms like delirium, so confusion, falls, longer length of stay, and um, worse overall outcomes. And THINK is a good acronym to help remind us of what could contribute to delirium. So we think T for toxic situations, that could be something like shock, trauma, um, those medications we just went over, any kinds of respiratory changes, infectious processes. Um, sepsis is a really big contributing factor to delirium, one of the most common, because it is multi-system, and it affects our cognition and our uh, perceptions as well, potentially. And any non-pharmacological um, methods can be helpful for patients, but if we are not considering these, they can also be contributive. So assistive devices, so if you have patients that usually wear eyeglasses or hearing aids and they're not wearing them in the hospital setting, they're going to be more likely to be confused because they don't have good perception of their, around, their surroundings. Um, no noisy rooms with any of the machines going off, if they're bedridden most of the time and they're used to being up and active, that can be really detrimental. And of course, poor sleep, and we can all relate to that when we get we have less sleep, we don't function or think as clearly as we usually do, and that's even more so when we get older. Uh, metabolic changes or dehydration are also really common underlying conditions. Delirium is often confused for dementia, even though they're very different processes. Um, so I wanted to highlight a couple notable differences here. Delirium onset, like we talked about before, is rapid, so hours to days, and dementia is more of a slow process. This would be more like months to years, and usually family members or caregivers, people that see the patient regularly, can identify something much, much more longer that, um, that was something that they were con concerned about, like memory or forgetfulness. That would be something that would alarm us to dementia. Um, the course of, of action, or the course for this syndrome, is fluctuating, and for dementia, it's more of a slow, progressive illness. Um, it is not something that we can treat. It's something that maybe we can slow the progress progression of, but um, delirium, for example, is something that we could potentially reverse if the underlying conditions are treated quickly. However, the longer it goes on, the worse the outcomes can be. And delirium is a large-scale problem. It's actually very prevalent in the ICUs. Most patients in the ICUs, unfortunately, will experience delirium during their hospital stay. Um, depending on the study you look at in the year, uh, up to two-thirds of patients will experience delirium in the hospital, and almost 80% of patients on mechanical ventilation will experience delirium as well. Patients remember these moments, which is very scary because their perceptions are very altered and they're confused. They feel like they're in different places and typically they feel like they're being harmed in some way or another. And this is where the agitation comes from. So these are things that you can actually, you can look up on the Vanderbilt website and you can see patient testimonies about what their experience was like with delirium and how frightening and confusing that was for them. And it's something that can stick with them for a long time. They've also started doing some studies on PTSD related to delirium experiences in the hospital and um, residual depression and anxiety that, that uh, is from a delirium episode. Um, up to a third of patients die within a year after their hospital discharge, which is really significant. And those that do survive, they're left with really expensive hospital bills because of longer lengths of stay, a battery of diagnostic testing, um, more lab work, exposure to hospital-acquired infections, and long-term, long it's, it's really expensive for the United States in general, up to $150 billion a year after hospital. And this is really speaking to the fact that patients decline significantly whenever they're discharged home after a delirium episode. They continue to suffer both mentally and physically and may not fully ever resume back to their baseline functioning. And this, this number here doesn't even take into account um, caregivers like family members or spouses that have to leave work to take care of their now disabled family member. So when we started this prob uh, project, we wanted to look at the differences between how we practice and what the evidence told us we should be doing. 
So we use multiple terms for delirium. Uh, delirium was actually not one of the common terms we used. So it was difficult to all get on the same page with what we were looking at. Um, encephalopathy is a really, a really common term, and this, this speaks to like an underlying infectious or metabolic process. This is a term you'll usually hear physicians or neurologists use because this is something that you can bill for, so I think that makes a big difference. Um, altered mental status, ICU psychosis, conf acute confusional state, those are really common terms, um, and I think that's how we communicate with one another in nursing. However, one thing that I, I dislike about those terms is it, it kind of causes a stigma or almost normalizing in some ways on the opposite end of the spectrum of these conditions where we almost expect this to occur, so therefore we have a lack of urgency in treating it or, or looking at underlying causes. We had no formal screening tools in place, so we weren't picking up on anything um, without a physical assessment alone. There was no baseline mental status assessments being done, and the reason this is important is if you don't know where a patient was normally um, as far as mental status or physical functioning goes, we really don't know how to get them back to where they were before. So if they're coming into the hospital confused, we want to know when did the confusion occur, when did it start at least, and how were they functioning before that, and when was before that. So if we have, um, if we have a, a measurement where we can look at this when a patient's admitted to the hospital, we can start moving forward from there to get them back to that place. Uh, and then we used high-risk medications to help keep patients calm, um, comfortable, and decrease any agitation or restlessness. And although that was very good intentions, and we all do that, uh, if that's the only thing that we're using as far as interventions go, or if that's the first thing that we're going to, we can really cause some harm in patients' long-term functioning, as we just saw. So the guidelines come from the National Institute of Clinical Health and Excellence, and also the um, American Academy of Critical Care Medicine. The American Academy of Critical Care Medicine, Jamie, you're really familiar with this because they have the A, B, C, D, E, F. Yeah, we have a lot of letters now. But the D in the A, B, C, D, E, F, G protocol is for delirium and yours is also in there for sepsis. So this is something that we really look forward to because they, they update it constantly and there's a lot of uh, research being done on that. So those are some of the guidelines that we look towards. Uh, they do recommend a valid and reliable screening tool to be used once a shift on all patients in the ICU, not just the ones under sedation or that are obviously confused. And then they recommend to check a baseline mental status on all patients, whether it's in the ER or once they get to the floor, as long as it's being done consistently on all patients. Um, they recommend to limit the high-risk medications and to use non-pharmacological nursing interventions like assisting patients to walk if they feel restless, if it's possible, um, removing any unnecessary tethers. So when I say tethers, it could be any lines that are attached to the patient that they aren't normally used to. So if they're not used to wearing a Foley catheter, that can be a tether. Um, any of the e EKG leads can be tethers, just anything keeping a patient stuck to their bed, which of course we want in the hospital because we want to keep people safe, but it can be extra stimulus for people that aren't used to that. Um, providing hearing aids, eyeglasses, and uh, maybe a sitter if necessary. We looked towards the literature to see what some of the themes were in other studies, what did other people do that might give us a heads up on uh, some things we should be cautious of or barriers that we may encounter along the way. Um, the American Nursing Association sent out a, well, part of their delirium work group sent out a, a big study, a big survey in I think 2015 where this should, I, I believe it went to all registered nurses in the United States and it looked at what do you currently use to manage, treat, or screen for delirium and how much, how much do you feel like you know about delirium? So it was really getting at what are we doing and, and where can we improve on this? They had uh, 1,500 responses, so it wasn't a valid survey, but we have a good baseline of, of what people are doing nationwide. And it showed, you know, nurses felt like, I didn't learn this in nursing school, I don't have any formal training, I'm not sure how to approach this, and I feel a little overwhelmed with these patients. They, uh, other studies showed that delirium is really commonly overlooked, and both studying physicians and nurses, only a third of physicians and nurses can pick up delirium just with physical assessment alone. So two-thirds of the patients are being missed, that's the majority. And the confusion assessment for the ICU is a valid and reliable screening tool, and I'll talk more about that in a minute because that is one that we selected. 
but however it is recommended for hands-on training so not just didactic training alone like what I'm doing right now we have to get in there and um, show people how to use it because it is a simple and quick tool if you understand how to navigate it so it really requires hands-on training and I know that this is difficult to see but I'll walk you through it a little bit this is the confusion assessment method for the ICU, which was originally adapted from the confusion assessment method, which was developed by Dr. Sharon Inoue from Harvard Medical School in the early 1990s. And this was developed from Dr. Uh, Wes Ely, who actually helped us with the study, and he works at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. This was validated in 2001, um, also with mechanically ventilated patients, so it's helpful for all patients in the ICU. Um, the, this is a four-part four part screening tool, and before we do the screening tool, which is recommended to do once a shift, so every 12 hours, uh, we need to make sure that a patient is weaned off their sedation so they get a little holiday from that. And I like to think of this kind of as even if the patient looks like they're with you on sedation, it might look like the lights are on, but is anybody home behind there? So what are you doing cognitively? Let's get the sedation tapered down briefly so we can see what, what's going on there. Um, so part one is assessing for the mental status, and we're looking at either or. So either a change from their baseline, so you must know their baseline before you can answer that question, or a change in the last 24 hours. So this is not necessarily a point-to-point -point assessment. So if you had a patient earlier in the morning and you ended up working all day, for example, hopefully that's not the case, but if it is, um, you're not doing how, did they, how were they presenting to me when I made this assessment earlier today and compared to right this moment now. Over the last 12, 24 hours, we want to make sure that the patient has, hasn't had any change in confusion, restlessness, sedation, anything like that. That would be an alarm that something might be going on here. So we want to, we don't want to be over cautious. It's almost better if we just say, if we think it might be the case, let's just say it is. And then going down to the second box in green, inattention is a, a hallmark feature of delirium. If a patient cannot concentrate on what you're saying, they're not processing information correctly or, or effectively. So this is actually where um, the assessment, I think, can be a little cumbersome because you have to use uh, some different techniques to get a patient to engage with you for that long. So I think the, the easiest one is save a heart, which is indicated here, and you'll, have, you'll instruct the patient to squeeze your hand every time you say the letter A. So you'll spell out save a heart. And you have to do it slowly enough where they can follow your instructions and maintain concentration. It's not just S-A-V-E-A. -E um, you go slowly. If a patient cannot squeeze your hands, if they have some sort of paralysis, uh, you can do other techniques too. I'm not going to go into all that because I could probably spend the entire hour going through this entire assessment. Um, the third part is the RAS, so the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale. And even though in the ICU we only do this on patients that are sedated, right, we have to do this on every single patient, so whether they're getting chemical sedation or not. Um, because this is really looking at whether it's chemical or just induced by some sort of mental status process. Uh, and the final, the final box here is disorganized thinking. And we're going to ask patients four simple questions, and this, these are questions anybody should be able to answer. For example, will a stone float on water? And there will be two, two answers that end in yes and two answers that end in no, just so we can have some good idea of, you know, patients not answering yes every single time we're asking a question. And three out of four must be um, positive for this to be an overall positive screening tool. Once this is positive, we think, okay, what might be going on underneath that we could start looking at to modify in the treatment? So um, our aims for improvement in this project <coughs> were to improve nursing awareness of delirium and to have good CAM-ICU competency when we are completing each assessment. We want to overall decrease the high-risk medication use in our patients and decrease our length of stay. When I show you the results, I'll also talk about some of the baseline data too, so we know where we started from. I used the Iowa model to help kind of guide this improvement project and keep us on track. Um, we had to first identify whether this was a problem or not, and since we weren't following up-to-date evidence-based guidelines, it was definitely a problem, and it is something that was a priority for our organization because we want to 
make sure patients have good outcomes and uh, we're not keeping them there any longer than needed because that can pose additional risks. Uh, we developed an interdisciplinary team and used experts from Vanderbilt University Medical Center. We went through all the literature and looked at the guidelines. We showed there's definitely sufficient evidence to start this and we developed a logic model to roll this out into phases. We conducted a baseline survey for all of the nurses in the MICU, which was our pilot unit. Um, we got an idea, just like the American Nursing Association did, we used their screening tool, as a matter of fact, um, to find out, you know, how much do you, do you know about this? Do you feel like you know enough? What are you doing to help uh, these patients and help yourself in the nursing realm? Uh, and then we, we recorded a health stream education so we could roll this out for all ICU nurses. Um, then we started to look at patient data and we embedded the CAM ICU for the ICU into the critical care uh, standard of care. We compared all results, both nursing surveys and patient data before and after our CAM ICU implementation. We tried to adjust for any problems we encountered along the way to make this project as sustainable as possible. This project was um, QIRB approved. All nursing and patient information was de-identified for privacy and um, none of, nobody's health information is out there. We were granted permission from Vanderbilt to use the CAM ICU in this study and to embed it into our own electronic medical records. And again, like I said, we used the American uh, Nurses Association Delirium Survey, which they granted us permission to do. Uh, I received no compensation for this project, and I think that is notable since I was um, helping Covenant as a nurse-led project uh, with their magnet accreditation. So you may notice some familiar faces here, but here is the, at the time, the day shift MICU and they were paramount to this. They were all very eager and helpful in rolling this out from the front line and offered lots of suggestions and jumped right in there. So our interdisciplinary team actually consisted of two intensivists, an acute care geriatric nurse practitioner, two pharmacists, all 59 nurses in the ICU at the time, nurse manager, nurse educator, Jamie, um, myself and we had two nurse champions on the day shift and two on the night shift as well. So they really served the purpose of keeping people uh, motivated to continue to do it. If they had questions, they were there to uh, ask and answer questions for them and show them how to do it if they, got a, if they stumbled on it a little bit. So in phase one, you can see we rolled this part out January 2017 through September 2017 and we really focused on collecting data during this phase. We looked, uh, at, we looked at the nursing survey to see how uh, all the nurses did at that time, what they felt like were their biggest challenges and where they felt like they were doing well. Um, we looked at all patients during this time in the MICU and we divided them into two groups. So since we didn't have a formal way of identifying who was actually experiencing delirium and who wasn't, we separated them into high risk or low risk category. And we did this by diagnosis. So the patients, for example, one of the high risk diagnoses would be sepsis, and one of the low risks would be something like a GI bleed, um, something that through the literature we show is less likely to develop delirium. And then we looked at these two groups, we compared their length of stay and their high risk medication use. Then we started to prepare for our intervention, so we had to build our team. We looked at the nursing education, which was recorded, and everybody had a chance to complete this before we rolled it out. The education was focused on basically what I'm telling you now about delirium, but in much more depth, and as well as how to complete the CAM ICU. Once they took the online training, we then spent a week with all of the nurses in the MICU, both day and night shift, really walking them through how to complete the CAM ICU, answer questions, and we kind of followed a see one, do one, teach one method. Um, this. We also continued to do spot checks, so we would watch a nurse or after they, were com after they had finished completing a CAM ICU, we would go in there and just double check to make sure that was accurate. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a form of punishment or to say you did it wrong, but we really wanted to make sure that we were doing this accurately so we could capture the um, patients at risk here. 
and we handed out pocket cards with the THINK acronym that I showed you earlier in one of the earlier slides. So once we did have CAM ICU positive screenings, the nurses really had a tool to look at to see which of these risk factors may be um, contributing to my patient's change in their mental status. So they had something to take to the interdisciplinary team on rounds and, and show them, you know, this might be contributing, let's look at this from a different angle. Uh, and then we built the CAM ICU into the critical care standard of care, uh, which prompted all nurses in the ICU to complete the CAM ICU once a shift. And then in phase two, we, um, we, we submitted the nursing surveys again to make sure that we had a change, right? We wanted to see, did what we provide for you, both education and hands-on training, did it help? Um, yes or no, and also what, what do you feel like is going well? How did the CAM ICU do? Is it feasible? Is it easy to use? Or was it more cumbersome and added to your workload? Um, we, we again separated the patients afterward from October to March into two groups because we didn't have enough positives to really look at that as an objective tool. So we continued to use the same method um, and then compared the high risk medication use in length of stay. And these were our primary outcomes again that we wanted to continue focusing on. So this is a pre-post design comparison. We use chi-square, control run charts, ANOVA and COVA um, to analyze our data and see how we did. And again, we, we grouped our patients into two main groups, both before and after the project. All right, this is a run chart. And starting on the far right down here, or my right, you can see this was the beginning of the project, January 2017, all the way through uh, March of 2018. So the vertical line indicates where we implemented the CAM ICU. So that was our intervention. And then there's a control upper limit, uh, the top dotted line, and the lower control limit at the bottom. And we had a lot of volatility in our high risk medication use. Sometimes we used a whole bunch, sometimes we didn't. It was really sporadic. Um, but the average use was 7.37% and we were able to significantly decrease that to 3.92%. And these are the patients without delirium or low risk for delirium, the ones that had the lower risk. And this is important because we don't want to convert these patients to delirium. They're still part of our general group that we're focusing on in the ICU because a lot of the ICU patients are going to experience this at some point. So we want to make sure this group is also being taken care of because we don't want to have more confused patients if we can, can um, control that through medications. And then this control run chart is, um, or run chart, excuse me, is for the group that were higher risk for delirium. And you can see we were already doing a better job comparatively at 4.73%. But again, lots of, lots of volatility. We were using a lot of it, then we weren't. Um, and again, the vertical line shows where we put the CAM ICU in place, and we were able to drop this significantly as well. There are two points here at the very far end, and both of these, um, both of these points indicate, and I, I did have to go through some data to, to look over this, but they were palliative care patients receiving end-of-life um, care. And this is, this is an interesting point, too, because when we think about high-risk medication use, overall we want to decrease those because we know now that it can really affect patients' long-term functioning. And we want to keep patients' quality of life over a long period of time good, uh, something that they can continue to feel independent and have autonomy in their own lives. But if we're thinking more about short-term quality of life, you know, these medications might help keep a patient comfortable or um, less agitated, and that might be our goal. So it's not that these medications are bad for everyone. We really want to think about what patient population we're looking at. And in some cases, that, that is going to happen in the ICU. So they're not always bad medications. Just want to avoid them when at all possible. Um, another point I want to make is when we, when we started this project, we looked at did high-risk medication alone as a factor lengthen um, hospital stay? And we showed that, yes, just by using high-risk medications, we showed length of stay was longer. Once we implemented the CAM ICU, we didn't find that any longer, just that using high risk medications just as a factor by itself was a factor in length of stay. But every additional high risk medication we used, we had longer length of stay. So the amount that we're giving is also an important factor as well. And I think that 
that each additional medication lengthened the hospital stay by 0 0.13 days. The dark line here at the bottom is the lower risk for delirium group throughout our entire study, and then the light, the light blue on the top is the high risk delirium group. And you can see throughout the study, the length of stay was longer for the delirium high risk group, which goes right along with the, um, the literature as well. So we didn't have a major impact on this part, um, which was one of our, our metrics that we were hoping to change but it is still a really important factor to focus on as we move forward in other uh, plan, do, study, act cycles of this project. And how did we do on the screening tools? We had 83% average completion rate in the MICU, and we were only measuring MICU. However, um, we did show, you know, with 83% completion, it was something that was prompted to be completed every single shift. So there was a little bit of work around there. It's not at 100. Um, we had too many unable to assess results and too few positive results. And I think that this speaks really more to nurses forgetting to completely taper down the sedation in order to do the screening tool accurately. So we're not getting a really good read on how the patient's mental status is at that time, which might speak to those two points. <coughs> and then the CAM ICU was being used in the step down units, and that was not an intent, that was an unintended consequence of this study. It was something, um, that once, once a nurse was transferring the patient from an ICU to a step-down unit, like med surge, if they didn't close out the critical care standard of care, then the nurses in the step-down unit were being prompted to complete the CAM ICU. And they weren't trained in it, and the CAM ICU is also not a valid tool for that particular setting. So we tried to put these flyers out at the nurse's station in the MICU to show you know, be cautious when you're transferring a patient, make sure you're closing this out because you're, you're having um, additional screenings for the, for the next team coming in that they're not really familiar with. So I think that might also be uh, a place that we could improve. Well, definitely can improve, but this might speak to why we're having too few um, positives and too many unable to assess results because the nurses weren't familiar with that. And the nurse survey showed us that before we did anything, just at baseline, they did feel more comfortable using high-risk medications to help keep patients calm and comfortable. Um, they, they noticed that it was challenging to take care of these patients because they had no protocols, policies, or screening tools in place. And they felt really uncomfortable and unfamiliar with how to recognize these patients that are at, uh, at risk for delirium. And even the patients that already had delirium, they didn't know how to, how to navigate that, um, which goes right along with the literature as well as exactly what we saw in some of the literature studies. Um, their greatest challenge at that time was they felt they didn't have a screening tool, so they didn't have an objective way to, to look at these patients. After our um, education and CAM ICU support, nurses felt that they were able to use safer interventions like ambulating patients when they felt restless, using eyeglasses, hearing aids, keeping the room nice and quiet, um, keeping patients more comfortable or having family sit in if, if possible. Uh, they felt more supported by their organization as a whole because they knew what policies were in place, they knew what screening tools they were using and how that was supposed to help. Um, in the CAM ICU feasibility screening tool, we, we showed that um, it was an effective tool to use, it was useful. They did have a little trouble completing, completing it at first but felt that the um, hands-on training was very useful. And their greatest challenge after our project was completed is they didn't feel like they could accurately communicate or adequately communicate their results with the interdisciplinary treatment team. So even though they had the information and they were doing a great job of collecting it, they still didn't have a good communication with the, uh, the rounding team to show, you know, here's what's going on with the patient. I've noticed this change. Here's a suggestion on their treatment and their plan of care. Um, so we still need to bridge that because that's really where um, we're able to see the biggest changes. And this wasn't something that we targeted necessarily, but I thought it was really interesting because of how well it paralleled with the literature. Um, the, dark, the dark blue indicates delirium risk group and the light blue indicates lower risk for delirium. And we can see that they are more likely to pass during their hospital stay and more likely to be transferred to a long-term care unit, even in our local population. So some key findings, um, the CAM-ICU was 83% consistent, which I am definitely going for a win here 
that was a huge accomplishment and um, we made a lot of progress in training the nurses and um, their comfort level improved as we went along. And we were able to significantly decrease high-risk medication use in both groups. The length of stay was longer in delirium, so we didn't necessarily make any changes here, but um, I'm hopeful that this might be a longer, um, a longer process that we'll see over time. And delirium may increase the risk for death and transfer to LTAC. So we can see that that happened. We don't know if that's directly correlated to delirium, but it's definitely something we should keep an eye on. And the CAM ICU was found to be feasible. Some of our limitations, since this was a 16-bed mixed medical ICU with 59 nurses, it was really small scale. And we can't say that it will work for every MICU out there. Um, so it's not generalizable, but it had good information and went along with what other people were finding, so that's promising. And ideally, we'd have a longer post-implementation time frame, but every good DNP project has to come to an end at some point. But this is something that we'll continue to focus on and monitor over time, but for the sake of data collection, um, that had to stop at a given point. Um, Evidence-based practice we know can improve care and is very successful when nurses roll this out. Nurses are on the front line. They know what works for their patients. They know what they're capable of accomplishing. Um, and they should, in, they should be involved and they do a great job at this. So this is something that we were able to add to the literature as well. Uh, assessment with the CAM ICU can provide an alert that something's changing in your patient's mental status to give you a quick um, alarm bell, so to speak. So we can look at different uh, treatment options here. And hands-on training is essential. The nurses felt like this was a really vital part of all their training for the CAM ICU and recognizing delirium. We were able to embed this in the Critical Care Academy as a permanent topic, um, both didactics for, for delirium and how to use the CAM ICU. And during our second plan do study act cycle, we're going to improve our, our accuracy and embed this more into discussion with the interdisciplinary rounds during the mornings. So we know that the CAM ICU does help identify delirium or at least a change in patient's mental status. And the CAM ICU tool increased nurses recognition for patient changes. Um, education alone may help decrease high risk medication use because we didn't have another uh, protocol or plan to, to tackle that. So all we, all we focused on was educating nursing on the risk factors and consequences of delirium and how this occurs and also a good way to, to monitor it. So this might be effective enough I um, always want to give a shout out to my advisors that helped me through this, Dr. Webb and Dr. Joaquin Song, who helped me with the stats. Um, and our experts came from Vanderbilt, Dr. Bowman, Dr. Pan, and Dr. Wes Ely was also a part of the initial stages of this. And here's my contact information if anybody wants to save a question for later and um, maybe ask about helping teach their staff or give another presentation on this. I think it's something that's really important and unfortunately I think a lot of us experience this with family members as they age or friends. We, we've likely all seen somebody suffer from this. So thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it. I think we have some time for questions. Dave, Wes, and um, Jamie will lead us. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Dr. Spiegelberg and um, Jamie would you like this? Oh, we can share, friend. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Incredible work by Dr. Spiegelberg, and I can honestly say Covenant Health was blessed that she chose us to do her, her research and her work um, to better patient care and outcomes. And so it was just my privilege to be able to assist her in that DMP project and make a new friend uh, through it all. But you can see how important her work is. And we all have experienced that loved one that's in the hospital and sick and in the ICU. And to hear numbers like that and to hear that these things lead to death is incredible. But I think what Jessica demonstrates, well, all kinds of things, role model, you're just amazing, but um, one of the things that she demonstrates with delirium particularly is that she found her passion and her passion guided her work. 
and it still is now her work. She is still so passionate about delirium that she's offering our surgical ICU nurses up here, hey, I'll come back and train. She dedicated hours and hours and hours, and I don't know that you could put into words, nor any of us, how many lessons we learned together on rolling out an evidence-based practice project in an organization, um, going through order set committees and med exec and the IT team and I, I, it just the list to get this data, all of that on and on and on. I feel like Jessica really grew into that doctor of nursing practice through this, this project for sure. Um, thank you so much um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for making it a better place for us to deliver care and making it a safer place for our patients to receive care by introducing evidence-based practice at the bedside. Do you want to entertain questions from the group? Because I'm sure somebody has comments and questions. I can even probably figure out who it's going to be. They will need this to hear it on YouTube. <laughs> who has a question for Jessica? I should say Dr. Spiegelberg. Forgive me. Call me Jessica. Wow. No, look at um, one thing I just kind of thought of while listening to your presentation, I work in med surge at Grace Medical Center, which is 95% post-op, and we do have, I wouldn't say a lot, but we have some post-anesthesia <laughs> delivery delirium in some patients, especially older ones. You mentioned that big number about patients with delirium dying and, and within a year of being discharged. Is that pretty strictly from just critical care? Does that apply to us as well? It does apply. It's, it's speaking to the syndrome as a whole. And I spared you of the pathophysiology of delirium, but it is extremely intricate. And it really starts to chip away at patients' um, perceptions. And so as that declines, patients' health also declines, so it's really multi-system. Um, but yeah, anybody that experiences delirium, especially the longer it goes on, the more at risk they are for, for passing from that. Yeah, but I bet you do see quite a bit in post-anesthesia. Thank you. Anybody else? Should I have a question? Yes, please. Um, in your post-intervention, the post-intervention and then the greatest challenge there was collaboration. So what are the thoughts or the plan or the um, approach to, because um, your tool is so valuable, your implementation is so valuable, so the collaboration part, what's, what's to help that? That's a good question. Um, there's actually a, a tool out called the Brain Roadmap, and it talks about, I, I didn't put it in my slide because I think that hopefully will be part of the next PDSA. Um, it talks about where a patient came from, so it really incorporates the baseline mental status and um, checks in with the results of the CAM-ICU and what sedation or pain medications that they're taking. So it's kind of a checklist that the nurses can take with them into interdisciplinary rounds. And I love this because it really gives a nurse an opportunity to speak up for their patients. I mean, they're the ones seeing them and taking care of them all day long. So they should have a really nice seat at the table during interdisciplinary rounds. Um, so I think it gives a good tool to use during those, those times. Um, one, one of the things I was able to do, I think it was a blessing really, because I could see this incorporated into other people's practice. And at Baylor Scott and White, they, they use this. And so the nurse is given kind of an opportunity to talk about how well the patient's doing as far as cognitive functioning, what medications are they on, what the nurse thinks is going well, and what they've noticed is not going well. And so this happens with every single patient on all rounds. And I thought that was, that was beautifully done because it is really interdisciplinary. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Of course. My voice is okay. Fine, so, I'm sure um, so as you've completed this long journey, we have several um, students in the audience who are about to embark on um, either a PhD or a DNP. What advice would you have for those that are about to begin that journey? Network mm -hmm. and make lots of friends. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's, and I think that's all been really, really helpful. I've met some really wonderful friends and um, peers. And I think, you know, pick something that you love because you're really gonna grow into this project. And well, regardless of what you, what you pick, and I'm, likely there will be many projects, but um, something that you want to dedicate a lot of time to and don't be afraid to ask for help. I think nurses sometimes get a bad rep for not wanting to help one another, but I did not have any of those experiences. I've had nothing but support and love from everybody. Um, and I think that was a nice testament to the work that we're all doing. So yeah, I network and, and lean on one another because it's tough sometimes. And you definitely will run into roadblocks, um, but don't give up because it's important work likely that you're doing. I mean, everybody's got good stuff going on. Yes, ma'am. Are there plans to expand to other units at Covenant? Mm -hmm. you do have yes, good question. Um, I'm not over there as often anymore, but I've had a lot of interest in rolling out um, another screening tool, so like the CAM, for example, in the med surge units. There have been a lot of people reaching out to see, when can we do this? Um, can we have some help rolling it out? And I think since I focused this project on Covenant, since they're merging with Providence, that's something that they're already doing. So I know it's an initiative from, from them on that side as well. But yes. I have one more question. Of course. I might have missed it. Did you see in the evidence or did you see any links to length of stay shortening because of this assessment? Does it affect length of stay that possibly could correlate to dollars saved for institutions? So not necessarily the assessment alone. That literature is a little bit mixed, but a multidisciplinary approach to to uh, delirium care is definitely associated with significant cost savings. Um, Dr. Inouye actually, um, she developed a program called HELP, which is Hospital Elder Life Program, and they, they have that embedded into several hospital systems up north, and it's trickling through the nation. I think it's really nice. It incorporates volunteers as sitters to engage patients in cognitive exercises, um, but she did a research on on this and how much it saves and it's it's substantial yeah mm -hmm. yes ma'am um so i have a question about the baseline so like i work in packing mm -hmm. so sometimes i see patients for 30 minutes sometimes i see them for six hours or all day um and so we don't really know their baseline mm -hmm. because we don't let family members back there and there's not I know what the nurse charted, hopefully, mm -hmm. by the time they get to me, when they did their initial assessment, it says spontaneously oriented and you know, can answer all questions. But I don't know their baseline. Mm -hmm. And they do have delirium, and the, and the only thing on my mind to give is the love. Right. <laughs> right. You're not alone. <laughs> That's a common problem in a lot of different areas, but especially where you're at. Um, I've noticed even going to other hospital systems, they still have a hard time because you know, we're all busy and it's hard to take a few minutes even to talk to a family member or call the nursing home that a patient came from and say, how long has this been going on? How are they functioning before this? Um, it's important, but it's, it's kind of a, a habit we've got to get into and that takes a little bit of time to undo old habits and start new ones. So. I think unfortunately it'll be a process, but to have that embedded into something like an ER assessment, I think would be so helpful. Um, and they do have a, a form of the CAM for the ED, which um, assesses this. So it's, have you talked to, a, mm -hmm. yes, the baseline, exactly. So hopefully someday we'll see this as well. I think that would be really helpful because it, it just embeds that process and likely that's the place you're gonna have a support person, right? <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? I kind of have. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, you mentioned the cam for like you know the med search floors. Um, you know, once the patient is identified um, for the delirium, you know, and trying to help prevent this from happening again, um, what would be like some of the big takeaways or tools that we could use now? Especially when I'm transferring a patient from the ICU that's had the delirium to a step down unit and just letting them know kind of what to watch for mm -hmm. um, and from that occurring again because usually when they transfer out a lot of like the surgeons have signed off to other providers mm -hmm. you know and that way that doesn't reoccur again <clears throat> and being 
readmitted back to the high level. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's really difficult when you're transferring out of a certain unit because you may be doing a great job of identifying what the underlying potential causes are and showing, you know, they've been delirious for several days now and they're starting to get better. And I think this is what attributed to it. So what we have right now is just our communication. Um, other hospitals have been a little bit more creative. I think there's some mixed results, but there's a delirium team that actually goes around and everybody that has a positive screening tool, they're on board with. So, um, I'm sorry, a positive screening, um, whether it's one time or multiple times, but I think having an advocate for a patient, whether it's a family member, I like to get family members involved. I, I go through all of the risk factors. I talk about what it is. Um, I tell them what to look for, just so they have an idea. Of, if it does happen, you know, don't be too alarmed. It's not dementia necessarily, and it can be resolved, but they're another set of eyes that can be an advocate for their family member or loved one. So getting family members involved is really helpful because they're going to be there through the transfer process. That's a good question. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, this concludes our Brown research.